June 2nd, 1998, Priesthood History in our 5th through 8th grade class. I'm so anxious for Heavenly Father's Spirit to guide me and all of you to listen and receive the truth as it happened in our time. Because of the nature of this class, this history must be given in summary. We come today to the subject of the 1953 raid. I realize this raid took place before you young people were born. It even took place two years before I was born. And I turn to the words of the prophets and also some words of Uncle Fred, who was there, that we can understand what took place. Uncle Roy said, We have not kept before the young people the importance of this great event. And to help you understand its importance, I'll remind you what you've already read in the Book of Mormon. Those who seem to stay faithful, they always remembered the captivity of their fathers. When people forgot what their fathers went through in order to give them their life and protection, that's when they turned to evil. So it's very important that you young people see how the prophets and other good people have defended you, protected you, made it so that you could be born in this priesthood work today. We've described to you how the government of the United States persecuted this priesthood through the years. After the manifesto was signed, and especially in the time of Heber J. Grant and thereafter, the Mormon Church persecuted this priesthood. There was a man named Governor Pyle, the governor of Arizona, who set forth a special effort to persecute this priesthood. For two years, he and the lawmakers in Arizona passed laws to make it legal what they were trying to do. They wanted to stamp out polygamy forever by going into Short Creek and carry away the men, women, and children. They wanted to put the men in jail, the women in detention homes. They wanted to take the children away from the parents adopt the children out, and then in a few years destroy the records so the children wouldn't know their lineage, where they came from. This was in the hearts of the lawmakers, and this raid involved many policemen, the National Guard, I use Uncle Fred's words to tell the story as it was taking place. The date was July 26, 1953. Uncle Roy said in one sermon how they wanted to come in at midnight in darkness. But the Lord wouldn't allow it. They finally came in about 4 a.m. Sunday morning. It was midnight. I heard the dynamite blasts that warned the townspeople the raid was coming on and to get up and be dressed. I saw a pickup shuttle through the village, Short Creek, this is Uncle Fred's words. 
giving the call to assemble at the schoolhouse. In record time they gathered. One of the fellows hurried across the lots and started the generator. The people went inside. The building had been carefully set up for worship. Men and women took their places quickly and without comment. While the elders went to the stand, grave-faced but perfectly composed, two sat and one stood at the pulpit, and perfect attention was given to Uncle Roy. Uncle Roy stood forth as the leader of this people on this great occasion. He was solid and prophetic, his steel-gray eyes and vibrant voice sweetly and willingly respected. He wore an overcoat and was a little hoarse but undaunted and fearless. He explained the reasons for our calling you together, said Uncle Roy. We want to be ready when they come. So the people knew the raid was going to come. The hymn books were opened, and they sang the songs of Zion. He then talks about his father. You can put that picture on. Patriarch Joseph S. Jessup. Uncle Rich's father, Uncle Fred's father. I saw the elders beckon outside received the whispered report of intercepted radio conversation. There was a witness among the townspeople calling by radio the police outside the town. This patriarch dedicated the people to the Lord. Breathless, we heard the report to stand true to God. And this has not come upon us because we failed to keep God's commandments or broken any moral law, but because the Lord has found a people willing to be made an example of. Let us rid our hearts of all disunity or ill feelings toward one another. We are all in his hands. There were more songs of prayer and praise. Here came a runner from the top of the hill who stumbled in, telling them of the long line of blacked-out police cars coming down the road. So the people went out of the schoolhouse onto the front lawn. All eyes turned toward the horizon as husbands held tight, hand clasped to their wives and the few children not left in the house. They were told not to cry. We must be brave and God will take care of us. The low moan of sirens and flashing red lights and sweeping spotlights moving like a serpent coming in on the waiting community filled every heart with apprehension. This is it. Someone rang the bell. The elder called Sing and the nerves of the compact little group then responded to the patriotic song, America. So as the police came upon them, they began singing that patriotic song. One of the soldiers, a veteran, gave the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag before it was completely raised. By this time, the county sheriff's car leading the army was in front of the schoolhouse. The sheriff, with a trace of tension in his voice, called out through a radio speaker, Stay where you are, stay where you are. This is Sheriff Porter. We have warrants for your arrest. Stay where you are. No sooner had the first word sounded than the pr police cars bristling with artillery filled the streets. Every officer covered another officer. They all had their guns ready to use. They were told there was a rebellion. 
perhaps danger the people would fight. Their hands only inches away from their undrawn guns. All was poised to handle a dirty mess, but there was none. Uncle Roy, in fearless but not unkind voice, sounded out clear above the tumult. Why have you come here? We're bothering no one. Why don't you let us alone? We're not giving up if it costs the blood of every man of us. Why don't you clean up your own places? You are a bunch of cowards to come so upon us, said Uncle Roy to the policeman. This he said as he strode from officer to officer. There I saw a man, Uncle Roy, the world calls brave, talking about the policemen. The policemen had their guns. These brave policemen who would arrest the desperate cr criminals. And yet Uncle Roy stood barehanded and bareheaded before the officers. He snatched a frightened child from her mother, presenting it to the officer who was armed to the teeth. They had their tear gas guns, their other rifles. And Uncle Roy, holding the child, says, Have you the heart to take this screaming child from its mother? Have you? I saw the patriarch, Joseph Smith Jessup, Uncle Fred's father, step forward, his bo voice booming, saying, If it's blood you want, take mine, I'm ready. The officers in charge had to fight back the pressmen by the hundred, the newspaper people, with their cameras, until they could take the photographs and the evidence. The well-ordered chapel room was quickly converted into a courtroom. Officials and the police officers smoked and littered the Sunday school room. One side room guarded on every side was as the made was made the jail. Men were hauled into court and thus sent to prison. Women and children with none to counsel or advise them milled about the schoolyard but were forbidden to leave. The whole town was under a kind of martial law. Every home had been invaded. Literature, deeds, documents, books, Bibles, and effects were taken by police officers, investigators, and welfare agents. Women and children were rounded up to attend court, charged like their husbands with conspiracy, to commit adultery, bigamy, white slavery, and other things. Certain numbers of the National Guard, with their gear for occupation, set up a radio station, field kitchen, road blockades, medic stations, welfare and officer quarters. Breakfast was hours late. Men from the Chow March marched to the field kitchen in a pasture a quarter mile distant. They waved and smiled at their families. And then they heard the governor's radio speech, speaking from the capital city of Arizona, saying how he was going to provide for the children happiness of their own choosing, that they were putting down an insurrection, a rebellion, I'm just quoting parts of Uncle Fred's report. The men were then taken off to jail, went down to Kingman. And during that week, the women and children were rounded up, and the children were going to be taken away from their mothers. But the mothers would not leave their children. 
and they got onto the buses with the children, went with the children and were scattered throughout Arizona, put in different homes, until the court cases could be fought in court. The lawmakers were sure they could take the children away from their parents legally. They had planned it so carefully. After the women and children were taken away in buses, the men were bailed out of jail, and they returned to empty homes. I'll have Marilyn put some pictures onto the screen for you to see. We'll describe these pictures as we go. The lower left picture shows one of the investigators quizzing one of the ladies with her children around her. Up in the top left you can see the patriarch Joseph Smith Jessup with Mabel Ann, Uncle Roy's wife. A short time after the people were taken out of Short Creek, Patriarch Joseph S. Jessup, broken-hearted, became ill and died. The people in the picture on the top right were the ones that went to his funeral a short time later. Show the next one. I wish you could put it a little lower where we could see it out of the light. See them digging his grave in the top right corner. The people in that picture, top left, were at his funeral. Another picture. We didn't get Uncle Virgil. Okay. We have other pictures of the men in Short Creek without their families. Here's how Uncle Fred described it. Loyal mothers heroically refusing to be separated from their own flesh and blood would rather submitted to extinction. From Sunday to Saturday, the awful strain continued when the few older boys left to take care of the cows and they watched the caravan make off with the political kidnap of their loving mothers and dear little brothers and sisters stood courageously in a downpour of rain, wept graciously from heaven to cleanse the evacuated little town of the stench of tobacco smoke and the vile influences of evil people. It says, Thirty-one men and nine childless women and grandmothers arrived home after the mothers and children were taken away. No lights shone in the village. All was quiet and still. The air was sweet and fresh from the rain. One by one the men alighted from the truck, took his hat and jacket in hand, and entered in at his own gate, found overturned playthings left on the pathway, his house dark and quiet. No light shone in the window, no loving companion heard his footfalls, nor welcomed him home. The rooms littered showed a hurried leave. The children's beds were all empty. His house left desolate. He was all alone. Doubtless the pen has never t been touched, able to describe the feelings that coursed through the hearts of every man as he realized his situation. In his mind, his saw, as the woman in travail, who is about to be delivered, born and seized by the state, and never know its birthright. He mentally saw and heard infant children kneeling, saying sweet prayers for their father. Can you imagine coming home and not knowing what would happen? I ask you to go home tonight or today and imagine tonight 
all of you taken away and placed among the Gentiles, not allowed to see your fathers. And in this day and time, perhaps not even able to see your mothers, having to live among them in their ways. We look back now and rejoice in the deliverance the Lord gave. But at that time, this people didn't know what was going to happen and what the end would be. I invite the teachers to get this tr book, The Truth, and show the picture of many of the children taken in the 53 raid. These are only part of them. According to one record in this Truth magazine, it said 120 adults, 263 children. The raid was made to destroy our families. And if they could win the court cases and take the children away, then Utah was ready to do it here in this state. Take the children away from the parents. And Utah even tried in the Vera Black case. I know we are so blessed, dear young people. We sit in our time of wealth with every need taken care of. But the people then were in a poor condition, in a desert land. They didn't have electricity except by a generator. They were there to do the will of God under the direction of the prophet of God. And they were seeking to abide the celestial law of plural marriage and the holy united order. The Lord had a purpose in all this. And I'll leave that for our next discussion. I was anxious for you to hear Uncle Fred's words today. Fulfill his promise.